what the API was to talk to the battery management, um, to control it and monitor it, uh, turn the screen off, all those sort of things. Um, but uh, very fortunately, there was some bright spark on the PyTop forums who basically reverse engineered everything and published it for us. So we were able to do that. And uh, Andrew's been burning the midnight oil doing the software um, for that. So what do you get in, in, in a PyTop Pro? So, well, yes, at the heart of the PyTop Pro, therefore, is a Raspberry Pi. Now, you can have, well, any version of Raspberry Pi you want in there. We can always set it either with a, with a Pi 2 or a Pi 3. Um, people, we think, might wish to go with a Pi 2 rather than a Pi 3 uh, for risk-loss users on the basis that there's not a, a lot of speed um, improvement, and it's uh, and the other uh, improvements on a Pi 3, like the fact it's got Bluetooth and Wi-Fi on the board, can't be used by Riscos. But the thing is, because it does use a later generation ARM CPU, some bits of software didn't work straight away. Um, it's now, most of the, well, no, I shouldn't say most, a number of the significant programs that didn't work on a Pi 3 um, have now been updated, you know, the operating system was, um, and then there were things like NetSurf didn't work, but that was fairly quickly fixed. Um, in actual fact, yes, the, NetSurf, the reason why NetSurf didn't work was because it needed the particular Unix library that um, needed to be recompiled, and the thing is there are, it actually doesn't, it doesn't get shipped as a separate library, it's integrated into the program, so you have to have a, you can't just replace the library in your program. So any program that uses the same uh, Unix library that uh, the NetSurf does, does need to be recompiled. Quite a few of them seem to have been. Um, one of the other programs that didn't work um, was the, uh, was Photodesk, which I'll talk about later, but that, that has now been um, done. I'm not aware of any key applications that are not Pi 3 compatible, but we need to try and get a list together that is. But for those people that say, well, I, I would prefer to be reassured about the compatibility, we offer it with um, the Pi 2 um, uh, option. Now, so in there, so you've got the Raspberry Pi, in actual fact, it's take off this cover. So, so you have the Raspberry Pi sitting there and then basically um, we've got uh, the speaker, so you've got a speaker connected and this is the nano router um, which I'll come back to in a moment. But so all fits inside, um, you've got a 1366 by 768 LCD. Wiscos can't cope with 1366, so it's actually 1360 by um, 768 for Wiscos. So if you really looked very, very hard, you will find there are six duplicate, um, yes, duplicated columns of pixels, but it's all you have to draw almost like a, a very thin line. It's almost vertical and you can just about see it if you look hard. Um, so yes, it has an 82 key keyboard, um, which yes, that posed a bit of a problem, but we've now got round um, all of that fortunately. Um, uh, and that, you know, well, the problem was that pressing the function key, uh, so there's a, basically yes, the top row has is designed for various things like uh, adjusting, your, adjusting your brilliance and contrast um, and speakers, um, but yeah, they, the, the sort of multimedia type facilities, um, they aren't actually supported um, under RISCOS, but the important thing of course for RISCOS users is function keys, because you use function keys an awful lot. So there's a, a FN key down in the corner here, but pressing FN and uh, the relevant key didn't do 
always wanted. But uh, some bright spark, uh, John Abbott spot, spotted on the forums that in actual fact the problem is risk loss by default has num lock, num lock on. And for some reason or other, the keyboard that's in here, which has its own microcontroller, doesn't like that. Turn the num lock off, and when lo and behold, it, it works. Um, Trying to think, my hand isn't quite. You know, well, I've just broke down FM F12 and got the star prompt, and so if I press the return again, it will just redraw the screen back correctly. So, so that that works. Um, we do have um, other facilities that uh, I forgot to bring a list with me that. Um, on the, on the keyboard using the um, using HID from XAT, um, it then allows uh, you to like do some programming of keys along here. It also provides on the screen um, the you can just about see put down there. I press caps lock and a light uh, sorry and a green icon appears there. Um, because there aren't any caps lock or shift lock or num lock light on here, but they, there is an application that provides it on the screen so that lets you know where you are. Um, so that's the, uh, the keyboard. The keyboard is slightly smaller um, than, say, like a recipe C keyboard. Uh, we measure it about, I think it's 86% of the size. From, you know, for the, for across the same number of keys. So this is a more common one. So you can see it's if I yes put the number, it's it's not vastly um, smaller. So most people, I think, you know, if you've got very got thick fingers, then it might be a bit of a problem. But for most people, you can um, you know. It's, it's not a, a significant problem, um, so it's uh, quite usable for that. Then, um, so, so it has the integrated touchpad and left and right mice button. Um, the uh, Alt GR by default in, in uh, you may see as I press it, gives you your menu. Um, So, so you, you get your menu from that. Um, right, power saving. Um, there are various power saving features. First off, the power save module um, that a Riscos has had for a long time and was integrated into the Acorn A4 and that, that was updated a while back and now is um, uh, in the operating system, but effectively actually in all versions of the operating system not just um, for the uh, for Pi based ones. Um, in actual fact, that, so that basically means that when the system detects it's not you know, working hard, it drops the clock speed. <coughs> now, you can, that can be useful because there are one or two of the more higher spec systems that, you know, if they were running full speed all the time, you might start to get a bit warm. So on things like the, uh, the Rapido, uh, IG, the, the iGet base system and the Titanium, you, uh, the, you, there is software in the system that will scale it down when, you, when you're not using it. In actual fact, um, we have to thank uh, Chris Johnson up in Edinburgh, who's a nice little software called CPU Clock. And it will reflect on the on the on the keyboard on on, sorry, on the icon bar what the clock speed is, and um, you'll see that literally it drops down low. You start doing something, it jumps up. Stop. It drops down again. And on that, he's also built in a facility whereby um, if you can read the temperature sensitive set the temperature of the system on a chip that's in all these modern computers. So it's not like, well, we have a temperature sensor on our real-time board, but that tells you the ambient temperature in the, in the computer. But you want to need to know what the chip is actually doing. So using that, um, 
you can actually set uh, a temperature. You say, well, don't go above this temperature, and the software then, if you hit that temperature, it slows it to the lower slower speed. Um, like on the iGate board, I think it's from 1500 megahertz to 500 megahertz until it's dropped by five degrees, and then it will start up again at a faster speed. Um, so that's the, so it has the power saving in that built in. Also, um, it uh, riscos the power saving. What it does is um, <clears throat> you can turn off the, the backlight. Uh, we've got a screen saver that comes with it, so that will turn when the screen saver, instead of going to a screen server, it turns the backlight off. So you save you save your battery. Um, talking about battery, the battery they do well. They talk about ten hours plus, and we have had them, you know running for that sort of time. Um, a Pi 3 though is a bit more memory hungry and we have, did find the other day we had two of them on test and one was a Pi 3 and one was a Pi 2 and um, the, what the, mem what the, uh, the smart battery managing software that we've got written does when it gets to a particular percentage and I forgot what it is now it pops up a warning but uh, if you really let it go down to like, I think it's 5%, it says, right, no, you've had enough, <laughs> I'm cutting you off there, and it actually does power it down. Because there is a, if you do fully discharge the battery in, in a Pi Top, um, sometimes there have, been, there have been known to be some issues getting it to power again, because basically, a totally flat battery, the power drain is to start charging it, it says, oh, that's rather a lot of power, um, too much drain, I won't do anything, so it, it refuses and you're in a vicious circle. Um, but uh, So we've got that built in to, to keep things going. Um, so can you remind me, how long have we I got? Uh, half an hour. Thank you. A little bit less, because he starts at 12 minutes. So yes, so basically after, um, so the Pi 2, you could plug it, uh, for, for, for Raspbian, you could plug it, you came with a Wi-Fi dongle, for the Pi 3, you have a Wi-Fi built onto the motherboard. Unfortunately, Riscus can't use it, but what Riscus can do is use one of these little nano routers, which uh, I know a lot, number of people have used in the past in a variety of ways on, on Riscus machines. And, um, the great thing about this particular one is, apart from the fact it, it A fits in quite relatively neatly, um, it, it, uh, we use some like flat cables that go from the network port and the bottom uh, USB um, <laughs> underneath here, because the USB is basically used to power power it, and that's the network. And that basically, so it takes in Wi-Fi, it, it, a lot of people, we, we've sold this for various people, if you've got a risk PC and you want to risk it to, to have Wi-Fi on your risk PC, you can get one of those, power it via, you know, uh, via a, either there are various of these ones with mains, or we can do a USB charger, and that just basically once set up uh, the unit, then just gives you Wi-Fi into your Ethernet socket. Um, the nice thing about this, these particular units are now that the latest version of Otter can be used to program it. So, in actual fact, if you want to go down to the local <coughs> Costa Coffee, or whatever it is, um, and use their Wi-Fi, you should be able to set it up and use it. I've not actually got around to doing that, but uh, um, I'm sure it's really quite as easy to do as the, the stand on the standard PC, which really just says, oh, where are your networks? This is your network. <coughs> Enter your password. But it can be done. We, we have actually used Otter to set it up so we can use our, our the network, the Wi-Fi network we have at the shop. Um, right. So, and then the thing is, of course, when you actually shut it down, it does turn the power off. Now there is a little little thing in the way the system when you you can't because um, basically on here. There is power management microcontroller. 
And once you've told the microcontroller to shut down, it says, all right, okay, I'll shut down. And it waits 10 seconds just to be 100% sure everything else is finished. So in RISCOS terms, normally when you say shut down, it often just goes straight away. But it will, it does wait before it um, uh, actually does that uh, 10 seconds. So we've built in a little thing. I'll just do it now. Um, off and it just says the computer will switch off in seven seconds six seconds five <laughs> so unfortunately we couldn't put we, we couldn't put anything in there saying and you can press you know this to restart because once the controller has been told it you can't rescind the command but um, yes yeah, so once it's powered off there's a you know, button here is monitored uh, and you have to press it for slightly longer than that will come on and obviously it boots as quick as you know, any of your normal. Is that, is that showing you the rainbow square or is that right? Uh, no, no, there's a there's a sort of sticker on the oh, which we haven't removed at the, oh, right. yeah, the screen what, protector. The rainbow is about, yes, yeah, yeah no, you've either got no yeah. in actual fact they have updated it. The latest yeah, see, yeah. kernel will do a mixture of either um, low power or high temperature, um, apparently. I've not, not seen They changed the, they changed the icon to, to, a, lightning, to a, a lightning thing for low power and, and the thermometer's for high, I think. Seems like a very good idea to me. Now, that's, that's one of the great things, actually, about the Raspberry Pi, because so much of what you, need, you do um, in setting up and doing all these fancy features is actually controlled in the um, in the it's a start well start.elf is the software that controls it and does it and you can tell it what you want to do in config txt which is which is uh, makes life very you know, quite easy and nice for, for risk or so so there are quite a few things like when i found out oh you, it does support rotated screens and i just found oh yes you just add a command in and to do the rotated screen it just works you know the risk cost doesn't need to know anything so it's one of the nice features, and they do seem to be keep adding a few extra bits and pieces into that you can control in start that out. So, um, what else we got? Um, yeah, there, there is. So basically, there's control. There's control for you know the screen brilliance, brightness um, uh, that can be done under software, and we the software does make sure you can't turn the brilliance to zero. Because if you turn the brilliance to zero, you, how on earth do you get it back? <laughs> um, so that's the, uh, the adjustment. Um, So, so that is that is the unit. Um, the it is priced in dollars, unfortunately. So the price ain't going to be going down any time soon. Or most of our cost of it, or almost uh, a significant part of our cost, is in is in dollars. Um, uh, but uh, because yes, so the actual pie top and the pie, that one they do keep varying. Um, or the pie top itself, we have to buy. So that's the, uh, and I'll just leave that. It's currently saying 72% remaining. We turned it on first thing this morning. It wasn't actually at full charge then. But that's, uh, so that's the pie top row. Um, right, photo disk. Very pleased to say, actually, I think it's four years since the last update. But, um, uh, and the problem was it was sort of, didn't really want to work very well at all on, well, 
anything from the panda board onwards. Um, uh, worked on the Pi, but Pi 2 and Pi 3 were issues. Um, and not working on the iGet, the base systems, the, uh, the Rapidos, the t uh, all the titanium based systems. But I'm um, very glad to say that um, uh, someone has very busily, uh, I think it's the normal maintainer is actually in Switzerland, but um, this work was actually done um, by a gentleman in Germany, which we're very glad and thankful for. Um, and. Uh, so that, the, the thing is, it, so it's basically, it's not only compatible with the later hardware in running, loading and running, etc. Um, it had to be adapted so that it would work correctly in the, what they call the LTRGB modes, which is the screen modes um, that the uh, iGet based systems and the titanium based systems use. And also actually the Raspberry Pi does. If you use 64 color, um, 64k color mode in on a Raspberry Pi, it uses um, LTRGB, and um, it's to do with the order of the red, green, and blue. Um, and uh, <coughs> so d the operating system has had support for this over oh, five or six years, but some old bits of software, the way they worked, it wasn't a battle. It doesn't particularly affect. Um, how, how fast the thing happens, it just does it differently, it just needs to be set up appropriately. So, um, where are we? Let me just a second. Do, 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 do. Um, right, and the, the other thing is that was done at the same time was support for ZPP, that's with zero page protection. Um, as with pretty well any software, it's almost impossible to be 100% sure that you've found all zero-page accesses. There isn't anything you could search through your code because it's the way it works. Um, and it's that, you know, null point of dereferencing. It's when you call a particular various things and you happen to call them with a certain value, it can then cause a, uh, access to, um, to page zero. So, but uh, we think we've caught all the ones on that, so that was a, a good step forward for the longer term. Uh, and then the other thing is, one of the problems that uh, the, the Photodesk had, there were uh, quite a few JPEGs, some of the later design style, um, well, JPEGs that comply with the later standards of like progressive JPEGs. Progressive JPEG is what they, well, it's not needed actually really so much now, but when when everyone's broad back anyway, the internet was based on dial-up and that JPEG was introduced so that you get part of a picture and it slowly would improve in quality as more of the picture downloaded. But nowadays you don't really see that, but I think there's quite a few uh, cameras and sources of images now use progressive JPEG and they just wouldn't load into artwork, uh, into uh, photo desk. Um, in actual fact, there are ways and means, like I think was it we found that JClean will actually convert a, a, a progressive to a non-progressive, but you don't want to have to use that if you don't have to. Um, the other thing, there used to be an issue with, um, and this affected a number of programs, whereby if you rotated a JPEG, you ended up with stripes, Venetian blinds sort of effect. Now, the operating system has had been updated, so um, as part of the JPEG bounty, I believe, um, to, to, to get around that. But also, um, part of the work that uh, was done with Photodesk, that was um, where it, it now supports the JPEG standard up to what they call V8D. There are oh, later ones than that, but uh, um, they're rather esoteric. So, that's Photodesk, um, and we, we've got upgrades with us, which we can answer on CD, or we can email people, or you know, however, if you've got a copy, we can update you on that. Um, actually, yes, going back to, keep on Photodesk for one more minute, um, NutPy3 has just come out. Unfortunately, Photodesk, the latest version of Photodesk was just too late to get onto NutPy3. So if you do buy NutPy3, 
do contact us so that we can get you um, a later version because the version that's on the card is really not suitable for use on a Pi 3 to be quite honest. You will also have issues if you can get it to run at all. Um, so that's uh, the photo disk. So then we come on to our two main machines, which of course is the Rapido family of the, the Rapido IG League and the titanium based one. Now, um, yeah, I mentioned the titanium based one as well at first. We um, yeah, are keeping our price at the moment the same as that, but it's the next batch we get is we're told because it's, it is likely to be higher because that of its costs were priced in dollars, but uh, we've got reasonable stocks at the moment, so we're able to keep that. Now, the, um, the great advantage of the titanium, which means it's the right machine for some people, but for other, machine, other people it's not necessarily appropriate, is the, uh, we see it as being the dual graphics output, the dual, dual monitor. Um, we've had, it dis had them displaying um, 2040, we've got some monitors that are 2048, um, well by, the actual monitors are 2048 by 1152, but actual fact we found that we can send it 2048 by 1280 and 2048 by 1440, and it, it scales it. It obviously starts getting a bit squashed, but it will do that. And they work on the titanium, um, as well as on the, uh, the IG, the IG based system. Um, and you can actually have two 2048 wide monitors on your titanium, if, if that's what you want, if your head moves that far, your neck moves that far, that'll give you a neckache. Um, now, there is sort of a prototype support for your desktop use of the two, two outputs, which works, um, we can demonstrate it on the stand, we've got a set up to do that. Um, and it, um, <coughs> it's a little bit, well you've got to load in this particular module, then run, um, sort of M, this particular MDF, then run that particular module, then change screen mode, then it displays it. Um, proper support for it and how they're going to cope with things like where do error boxes appear, if you say click full screen is it going to be both screens, is it going to be one screen, things like that. Apparently, um, uh, LSR have been in discussions with various people at Rural have been looking at how to do this, and they've now actually, as of the beginning of this month, decided how they're going to do things, but they haven't actually done it yet, um, and certainly anyone buying from us, we cannot guarantee that will appear, um, because it's outside our control, but, you know, in time that should appear but it's not likely to be sort of like next month uh, unfortunately but uh, if you want if you want dual screens that's the one to go for the extras that you can do things like PCI cards extra Ethernet um, I'm not too sure how many people well there's no risk cost support for basically cards apart from uh, a parallel printer port. It seems you can buy a USB to parallel adapter that does the same job. I don't think there's likely to be many people that want that or need that. Um, but it's got some extra options there. But uh, I think if, 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 if you needed um, any of those facilities, you'd know it. Um, because, well, because you're probably going to have to write your own software for it, so <laughs> you don't need to tell you if you need it. But if you don't, then basically um, we feel that the Inc. The iGet based system is the preferable one to go for. It, it's cheaper by a factor of um, what is it, so 280 pounds. Um, not quite as high spec in that we by default to put a small, slightly smaller SSD drive in there, but we can put the same size SSD drive in there and still save yourself about 250 pounds. Um, and the thing is, it, it does the same screen resolutions. It basically runs the same speed because it's the same ARM CPU core. For some reason or other, the SATA interface is actually slightly faster. I don't understand why, but you'd think it would be... Because they're basically, 
the two chips that are inside the two machines, both designed by TI, um, and but like it's one was I think done by one division aimed at one slightly different market from the other division, um, but they fundamentally do you know do do basically the same thing. But yes, SATA is faster um, on the uh, on the IGEP, and that's right, it's considerably faster than the um, ARMX6 SATA, which the ARMX6 SATA because they put it, uh, the software was done as a, uh, an add-on layer on top of SCSI FS, if I remember correctly. Um, so that slows it down, so it's sort of about half the speed, if not slightly slower. But, uh, but to give it its due, the, the IMX space systems, the IMX6, they do. There's one thing it does that neither, unfortunately, what we do offers, and that it does, if you want a screen mode of 2560 by 1440 or, or larger, it does it um, on our systems. That it's, they're limited to 2048, well, theoretically, by, two, by 2048. I have actually just found out that there is a monitor 1920 by 1920. Now, I want to try and see if I can get hold of one because whilst the system supports it, there is a, a maximum pixel width, bandwidth, um, and I don't know whether this particular monitor would support the, I think it needs to be about 30 hertz refresh rate to do 1920 by 1920. But that would be quite an interesting uh, display. Unfortunately, if you need to ask the price of the display, you probably can't afford it. <laughs> um, they are, well, they're under a thousand pounds, but uh, only... Oh, okay. Not a lot, so so you so do you want two? Did you say so? Uh, well, if yeah, actually, it would be interesting to see whether or not uh, yes, you could theoretically have because the um, on, on the uh, titanium based system because it effectively has to have the dual output, it has two effectively GPUs. So uh, if if it, if it supports 1920 by 1920 on one, it would support it on both at the same time, I believe. But uh, you were right to to see if that uh, uh, materialises. I'm trying to see if I can find a way of getting boring, getting hold of one for a week to try it, but uh, not without having to buy it. Um, thank you. Um, right, and then um, briefly, it's a minor, minor little thing. We just, just so happened our, I live very close to where the body shop, um, you know, people have sell so many stuff in High Street where they are um, in Littlehampton on the base and for some obscure reason their charitable they have a charitable foundation that um, they also run and they had a rather large quantity of these speakers and which I ended up buying from them and they're nice it's a pair of speakers um, the sound output we find is better than you get, you, well, you would think you would get from speakers like this, this size and this price, because I don't think it's how much they are, they're not a lot of money. Um, or is it, or is, you can, they've got a little magnet to them, so theoretically you can use it as a sound bar, as they call it. Um, but uh, it's powered, it's powered via a USB socket, but we can supply a power supply if you don't want to power it from your computer. But uh, they, they're a nice little pair of speakers and, and do a good job. And then one of the other things that uh, we do, um, it, took, it took about five years to find an optical, non-scroll wheel mouse. And we, we've had these now for about a couple of years, but the trouble was they were like 39 pounds each, which is rather expensive. But we've managed to, again, do a little special buy and we're now offering these out at 19 pounds each, so only mark, not a lot more expensive than a reasonable um, optical mouse. So it is, it's USB only, it's optical, it doesn't have a scroll wheel if you don't like scroll wheels. Um, and then, as I've only got about four minutes left, um, oh, well, two minutes, all oh, right, sorry, very briefly. Um, the, the new item that uh, well, in actual fact, this one, this one in here is second is second hand and not even being made anymore. But it 
Basically, the thing is, it's a graph one. The ha some graphics tablets will actually of work just simulating a mouse, as in they will move the pointer along and you press on it and it's equivalent to a click. But pressure sensitive uh, graphics tablets is really what most people want to try and use. And the thing is, this is pressure sensitive. And we will be demonstrating it with PhotoDesk um, on the stand in a minute. Very briefly, um, it's at the moment really just a beta. We was trying to source because that this particular tablet is no longer made. Um, we're trying to we're evaluating various tablets at the moment to see which we'll be able to do. It. Basically, expect for around a hundred pounds to be able to do a pressure sensitive tablet with the risk of software. Um, it's automatically PhotoDesk didn't require any extra software to be written because it uses the paint pal in the same interface as the paint pal used to do. So any program that used to work with a paint pal will work with it. And I'll be very interested to know which bits of software anyone knows of that will work with the paint pal interface. Um, PhotoDesk is anyone I know for sure. Now the other th program that some people do do use you to the push as one with artworks but that uses a different driver and it requires a new uh, an artworks plugin. I'll be hoping we're trying to try and, we're trying to track down the source for that um, to see if we can get that done as well. But basically um, so around the hundred pound mark, hopefully it's slightly less um, for one of that sort of size. You can obviously larger ones are available but considerably more money. But anyway, any questions um, if you haven't got time now, please do come and ask them on the on the stand and we'll try and help you.